So what would you like to do? What's your what's kind of on your plan for today? I would love what's to. Important? Yeah, because <laughs> um, I've been delving into the same topic as yourself with the yeah. reincarnation soul trap idea. Um, and what I'd like to focus on is solutions, if if we could, like what would you say are some of the things that we should do? Because I've laid out the problem a lot um, in videos I've done. I think people get the idea of um, what we may be involved in here with this soul trap idea. But what are some of the potential solutions that there may be that we could enact in our life while we're still alive so that we might have a better chance in the afterlife? I actually came up with a few of my own, so I'll uh, maybe start out and then you can yeah. add in yeah. some of your own and, and exactly. tell me Why what don't you, you do like a little intro, get us started, and then, yeah, just Great. in my head where you're headed here. So, yeah, start us up and then we'll go. Yeah, well, um, the way I do the podcast is like little highlight uh, reels in and out, uh, fading in and out of uh, relevant stuff. So I don't usually have like an intro. People already, my chat, they already know you. They're excited to have you on. Um, so um, just go uh, ahead then. Yeah. So with. Um, but before before you start, this is just for anybody watching, of course. I just want to say um, I'm, it's nice to be able to sit here with Eric. And the, one of the reasons is because, yes, we are discussing the same subjects. And um, and he's been kind enough to you've been kind enough to mention my name and my book in interviews that you've been doing. And that's a really important part of the process is sharing where else we get information from, uh, who else is, you know, and that doesn't happen very often on uh, certainly on in videos and in YouTube. So I just want to acknowledge it and say thank you for for. Um, having that kind of integrity with your work. Oh, appreciate it. I appreciate you. Actually, um, back in the day when I was first looking into this, I contacted you because I was going to buy your book and I wasn't able to. And you were kind enough to give it to me for free. Um, and it was an excellent book and it's been a great resource. So um, I recommend to anybody exit the cave part one. And I believe part two is coming to completion soon. Is that right? About 30 days. Yeah. Awesome. Be looking forward to yeah. that. Um, so yeah, I, I first came across, I think a long time ago, Wayne Bush. Um, he's one mm. of the first people I think to delve into this subject. Uh, he has a great website called trickedbythelight.com. And I'd, I'd seen that, but not delved too much further into it for a few years until I came across another guy called, um, I forgot his last name, Mark from Forever Conscious Research. And he was doing mm. similar work and he actually started interviewing Wayne. Um, and and then I came across your work and some other people and it's been the zeitgeist, I guess, uh, more and more people are coming to these conclusions or moving away from some of these other conclusions that like the New Age movement has kind of pushed on us. Because the more you look into things from different different angles, like um, near death experiences or ancient religions like Buddhism and how how what may happen after death, it, it seems like there's a level of manipulation and coercion, like there's, they're trying to get us to come back here. Um, so as far as solutions are concerned, the, the first place I went um, looking, because it seems like the, the religion, the current religion that is closest to what the message of the soul trap theory says, I would say is Buddhism, um, because Buddhism has reincarnation, as well as this idea that you, you shouldn't be reincarnated here and that a perfectly okay. lived life would result in us not coming back. So just those ideas alone um, make Buddhism kind of have this alignment with the soul trap theory. And then when you look into what Buddhists recommend, like the Buddha himself said in the Buddha Vachana, you may declare for yourself that I'm done with hell, with the animal realm, and with the sphere of afflicted spirits, finished with the plane of misery, the bad destination, the lower world. I am a stream enterer, no longer subject to rebirth in the lower world, fixed in destiny, heading for enlightenment. In other words, all we really need is a true intention to not come back here, and that 
in itself is enough. Though the rest of Buddhism seems to extrapolate on that, that there is more to it than just that, in that you're supposed to relinquish all desires and attachments to the material world, which I would say is probably the opposite side of the intention. So if your intention is to not come back here, that's the positive thing. The negative thing is you also have to get rid of all desires and attachments for anything that you would do in a physical body in the material world. So if you have any attachments or desires left, that would mean your intention isn't true or isn't 100%. So that's my second one, intention. Second one is relinquishing desires and attachments. Now the third one I've heard from you, um, you call it recapitulation, I think, which is the idea of maybe, maybe. go going through your going life through review your life. before you die. So maybe going through all the mistakes you've made or anything you're regretful or remorseful for owning and working through all the associated emotions so that if you do have a life review, some kind of judgment, that it's not this new thing to you and that you're, you can be easily emotionally manipulated and coerced into doing whatever it is the judges decide of you. If you've already owned everything in your life and you accept yourself for how you are you've forgiven yourself or whatever if somebody in an afterlife review comes up and says hey i think you know you did this wrong and shame on you and you need to be born again to um, fix your karma um, i'd imagine somebody who's gone through this recapitulation would be much more likely to be able to stand in their own power and not give in to whatever these manipulation and coercion techniques are that we might um, face. Another part of that is just living an ethical life. So trying to be moral so that if somebody is trying to pick apart every little piece of your life in a, in a judgment scene afterwards, that you don't have any glaring mistakes that you personally do feel regretful for because you tried your best and in this hellish world that's filled with other people enacting their own karma, makes it pretty difficult to not make some mistake. And I think that we need to be able to forgive ourselves and not think that we need to be perfect. Seems these other beings may think so. Um, uh, just a couple more. So number four was meditation. Uh, just being able to focus and not be diverted and drawn off. Because when we die, like the Tibetan and Egyptian books of the dead, it seems like there's going to be a bunch of you know, beings, tunnel of light, buzzing, humming sounds. There's going to be all of these novel experiences that would be easy, like a moth to the flame, to just be taken in by. Um, but if we have uh, a center for, um, if we practice meditation through our life, we may have a better chance at maintaining whatever intention we have, such as not being born again. Um, so practicing meditation, I would think, would be helpful. Lucid dreaming as well. So the afterlife state seems to be quite dreamlike. It's your consciousness lifting out of your body and experiencing new dreamlike states. So if you're able to become conscious of the fact that you're dreaming while you're dreaming by practicing lucid dreaming techniques, I would imagine similar to meditation, that could help us keep focus in the afterlife state and also out-of-body experiences would be number six, similar. If we're able to experience our consciousness rising out of our body and living in the astral realm or whatever you call it, um, if we're able to practice that and get comfortable with it before we die, I'd imagine when we're forced out of our bodies, uh, it'll be, uh, we'll be more able to deal with it better if we have that practice. And the last one, seven was just research, meaning the more we research these topics and the more we think about such things and having these kind of conversations, the more likely we would be to hopefully find an out um, versus if we just go along to get along, never think or research on these topics and then we die and are faced with all these things, we're not going to be prepared. So those were some of the things that I've thought of. Um, could you make uh, comments on some of those and or 
Um, tell me some others that you've thought of. I can comment. I've been writing as you talk. Excellent. Um, well, my new, my new book is is designed for this direction. You know, the first book was designed for what a lot of are coming on right now. Like you say, it's it's a big change. A lot of people are discussing the subject now, writing about this subject, talking about this subject. I think because the last four years have been so insane for so many people that they've had to kind of really question what this is. It's always been insane. It's not like it hasn't been insane before. It's just the insanity level got turned up to a high degree that it was high, it was more difficult to hide it. Um, still, the majority still thinks this place is fine, but there's a bigger minority now that feels there's a problem. So <clears throat> when you went through those uh, ideas, and I think perhaps Buddhism in its Buddhism or Zen or other um, other elements at their origin point were probably about we will say reaching reaching source and today it's about like it say it's about something different it's about becoming a really nice happy mm. guy mm -hmm. guy girl that's really what it's about now and they throw in these other ideas to kind of make it seem like you're doing something more than that but that's really what what it is when you when you break it down even the quote you read, right? The the quote is describing how I uh, that quote is saying I'm I'm releasing the lower world for something else. It's not saying I'm releasing that something else either. Mm. So they're trading one trap for in, right in the sentence. They're trading one trap for another trap, and this is what this happens a lot. This is you'll see this in in the, when you read through various I don't call them text, but the way people present things. They trade one for another. It's right in the language. Like as soon as you say my intention, talk about intention. Well, if you say my intention is not to be reborn, well, anyone who's watched Darren Brown knows that as soon as you throw the word not in there, you've you've also indicated the thing that you're going to have is going to be you're manifesting it. So by saying I don't, I'm not, I don't, I don't want to be reincarnated. What's going to happen? You're going to be reincarnated. <laughs> you've, mm. you've, you know, don't it's it's that don't think of a tree. You think of a tree. Right. It's that same kind of. So the intention has to become very clear on what you actually want, mm. not what you don't want. And that's a very, that requires refinement in the, um, in the way you put together that intention. So that's the first one. Like you can't just you can't just fire that off in in five minutes. It's a process, and and it should to do it well. It should take somebody weeks or months to really define exactly their intention. Uh, partially, yes, that intention should should move your consciousness and your awareness in a particular direction away from other things. Um, I'll just say one more and then you can begin the conversation back. It's it's um when it comes to desire and attachment, people read that statement and so they think, uh, I need to I need to stop my attachment or my wanting or my desire for various objects or experiences or and of course the only attachment you have to let go of is the is the attachment to yourself. Once the attachment to yourself is gone, then there are no, there, there's nothing else. What do you mean by self in that? Self. Your physical exactly. self or your, your, your very consciousness? Do you mean that? Um, that's the work. Mm. The first question would be, as soon as that comes up, is saying, well, what is, what is myself? What is this thing that I've actually declared myself to be? How do I, how do I know what it is first? And then how do I verify it's, it's, um, it's solidity, right? Mm. How do I know? How do I know I'm not a character in a video game? How mm. how would a, how would the character in the video game be able to test? Am I a character in a video game or am I in a real world? These are the kind of questions that Buddhism was supposed to get you to ask, but they don't really ask much anymore. They they kind of they, it's there kind of, you know, but not not like it probably was at its origin, like everything. No matter the religion, no matter the, the organization, at the core, there was usually somebody who was very, very aware, very, very alert and presented things in a particular way. But once you get 100, 200, 300 years past the next group, not only are they doing it consciously, but unconsciously, they're they're massaging the data 
so that they can have themselves in an easier position of power and control and the message becomes less important than their their standing and we find that in everything right so so like stuff is at the core but you have to unravel it to see what was probably there originally and what's just fluff that's been added in the, in the time since i'm thinking of somebody in a dream so imagine if somebody was a dream character and they try to become self-aware so the dream character sits there and thinks who am i who am i really now the the true answer to that question would be that he has his selfhood has no reality because he's a dream character and who he really is is the dreamer right so when we dream every night there's all these characters situations things are happening environments but the reality is that none of those characters exist none of those environments exist none of those situations are even really happening in the 3D space that the dream inhabits. What's really happening is the dreamer is dreaming a dream and the character is identifying as a piece of that. Now, potentially that's what's happening here. And I believe myself to be Eric and you to be Howdy, but ultimately we're just dream characters and the dreamer, which you could call God or the intelligent designer or whatever, the one originating source aspect that would be the real thing and the only real thing that exists and everything else is illusion or a maya including our physical bodies and our sense of self and if that was the case maybe just realizing the fact that you are a dream character in god's dream is enough to wake you up to the fact that what is there to be reborn as <laughs> And a reborn, be reborn as Eric? Well, Eric's dead, and Eric didn't exist to begin with. And now here you are in this afterlife realm, still believing yourself to be Eric? Well, maybe that in itself is enough to be reborn, because you haven't learned the lesson that you're not Eric. What do you think of that idea? Yeah, that's, that's I would say that's moving in the in the more correct direction, yeah, of, of, the, of, the, of the state that has to get unraveled to see through its it gets simple people try to simplify this and of course they would because it's um it's a pretty it's a pretty vast topic and um as i get a lot of people have come to me because i wrote eggs of the cave one a particular way i wrote it as a very kind of harsh presentation mm -hmm. because I, I felt some things needed to get shaken in the reader you know the reader's coming to this place this is a loving world god cares about me and i need to give that a bit of a shake for them to look deeper but once you've got to the point where you're looking deeper it's like okay now now the questions start to get vast and problem is is generally people want an easy solution if I just do this, if I just do that, if I say these mantras, if I sit this way, if I, you know, imagine this, it'll all work out. And <clears throat> it's not really that simple. It's it's a it's a it's a process that's been presented through history for whatever we call history. <laughs> presented for again, however many years we've been in the simulation. Um and it's 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 about having to first defi define reality, right? You have to define reality. You have to first and and just because like okay, Eric says dream characters in a dream. Well, how could you prove that? How could you test that? I, I took I took eight years, right? I took eight years to just test that hypothesis and pushed myself from around like 1999 to 2005. I mean, I pushed myself to near near the cracking point to test it so i mean i i know the answer to that question now because i could have had that realization so it's for me it's not a it's not even a, that that question doesn't even exist i know that answer i know what the answer of reality is then when i fell in the canyon in 2005 and had the had the realization of my own non-existence of my own again just being as a projection just like the world so so that realization became clear but the whole idea of well but there you can also be trapped so how does that function how does how do those 
realizations fit into the idea of that some of something's trapped like is it, if it's a dream how does something get trapped in a dream that seems pretty strange you know we wake up in the morning like you were saying and the dream seems to end none of our characters are trapped in like you know they're not trapped in my dreams but in a sense that's what we're saying as soon as all because ancient texts describe it as a dream because that's the maybe the easiest description they had at that particular time. Today, we might call it a simulation or a computer game or a video game or whatever, right? It's just because we're now in a technological kind of world, it's easier to present it in a technological way. The point being is it's, it's it, they're all saying it's not what you think it is. And then it's, well, how could you even get trapped or what can get trapped? So that that's literally the first part of the process, which is, the next stage of the work right the first stage of the work is seeing we've got a problem we've got a problem and that the realm is not what we i was told it was when i was a kid okay so the next problem has to be how do i define it how do i actually start a definition process of within where i really am hmm. now what do you mean by that what, what do you mean by a that? definition what? process De of where you really are so if if hmm. i've intuited that i'm similar to a character in a dream and this is kind of like a maybe a dream's world in god's mind mm -hmm. again i can't confirm or deny how well, can you define something define metaphysical it. when yeah. you can't even get to any evidence really right. for or against it to know if you're right <laughs> exactly so you know in my case <clears throat> and this is like I say way back now 25 years but i was really lucky to have a korean monk with me and these uh, native medicine men that I was spending time with and they kind of knew the direction I was on so they gave me exercises they gave me things to do and I was putting in 12 to 14 hours a day mm. like pushing myself to the wall of, of like nothing else was important and I was fairly lucky because I was still working as a comedian at the time so I really only had to work like three or four days nights a week right that was the extent of my time I had to put in to support myself to pay rent and buy food so all the rest of my time was free and I literally pumped it into um, I don't know what reality is so I'm going to test it but I got to a certain point in the process where I realized there was a, a correlation between what was in my mind and what was happening outside I mean to the degree that I realized that the word table was appearing in my head before the before the table in a sense could be manifested that I was actually even making the table and the chair and everything I'm sitting on. So I got the I got the curiosity to see what would happen then if I stopped all thought in my mind. Not to be still, not to be peaceful, but literally to see what would happen to reality. How dependent is reality on my thought? So I did like a science experiment, right? For like it took about four months before going through all these exercises until one day literally my mind switched off like we can go into somebody can sit still for a while and your thoughts will really go down low but there's still there'll still be some there mm. even if it's just uh, once in a while i'm breathing or i'm still i mean literally that it was like i got to the point of zero mm. no thought and at the point of no thought reality started to dissolve like it just started to go away <clears throat> and I told I told some of these stories before, so I'll share them here with with you and your audience. Like um, one time in the midst of this, I was at my girlfriend's house, and um, we were watching just television, you know. And I just said, "Oh, your sister's coming over." What? And all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door. Mm. Let's her in. She comes over. How, how did you know my sister was coming over? Well, I saw her park the car there in the driveway, and then she just walked up. And of course, the TV is up against the wall that has no windows in it, and she's like, "Well, honey, that's a wall." And I realized I had literally been seeing outside the whole time without a wall there. It just didn't exist. And then when I when she said that, the wall sort of reformed itself back in. So this was this was my reality for quite a while, actually, where literally things would just move in, move out. And, and I so I realized at the very least, reality is not some kind of static, solid uh, thing. It's it's at least transparent, and it's more likely sort of not even there and it's 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 related to the whatever projections i'm i'm firing out mm. um now i didn't 
at that time take the next step well there's also then something projecting me that there's also thoughts of me which are not here they're somewhere else and they're also projecting me so like i say how could you go check the projector but the suggestion generally is it's easier to test but for most people it's easier to test the world than it is to test yourself but some some can be very good at the way different ways of testing yourself that's what recapitulation is recapitulation is the way of testing it's really about testing your story it's about looking at the life you think you've lived and going over it in such fine detail so that at the end of it you realize what I thought the story of my life was is nothing like that at all. It was completely different. So we lose, we start losing the hold and the grips on a lot of the things we believed about ourselves because they're built on the story. You know, someone says, hey, how come you're, how come you're always upset when you see this thing? Oh, it's because, you know, when I was five, remember this happened to me? Well, if now all of a sudden, well, actually that didn't happen when I was five. So I no longer, that the character no longer has to behave in certain ways built on a story that you see didn't exist. So what it's doing is it's unraveling the character right now because you see that who I am now is built on this story. And once the story doesn't exist, similarly going through history, all of the world as it is now is built on this story of history. And once you unravel history, you start saying, well, there's no reason that reality has to, or the world has to be the way it is because history's a lie. So why do we need the world the way it is? It's the same you're doing with yourself. It's like, mm. a, it's like a, it's like a testing to see. It's really the recapitulation finds out why you've become the way you or why you believe you've become who you are and when you unravel that then you at least the character becomes free to kind of move in and out of the moment as they wish here hmm. now i've thought of this this idea of so if if you if you decide that you are not who you are and you're actually the dream you know you know i'm not a dream character i'm the dreamer I also have this this issue with that idea in that I like who I am. <laughs> I, I like Eric. I like my consciousness. I like you know everything. My memories. I I feel like I in a sense I would like to continue, and I feel like this could be a, an issue with the intention, because if 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 my intention to not be reborn again, I just my real beef is Earth. I don't like this place. I don't necessarily not want to exist anymore and not not be myself. Like if you just go back to being source, say, well, obviously source created everything that is. So source decided that it wanted to do this life thing, experience this earth thing, or maybe there's other realms or whatever. And if I just go back. What to if that, that's not true? What if that's just a belief too? Do, t do tell. How, well, no, what, I'm just if, saying if, that. If that was yeah, a because, belief. because that that that's a standard core of a lot of religious traditions to try to explain where we are yeah. and pin it to this source wanted to have experiences. Um, but no one's ever proven that. And right. it's, it sounds good. Once you've rejected the standard story of God is love and he's made me to grow and, you know, OK, well, we'll go to this other idea. But just like Neo, he comes out of the Matrix. He moves into the world of the Morpheus and Trinity, but he doesn't test is that a real world too? Or has he been mm -hmm. tricked in another matrix? He accepts mm -hmm. it automatically. So I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go back to sharing your story. I just want to make sure that it's it's presented to everybody that just because that's in like almost every religious uh and spiritual ideology you can find, it's never been verified. Right. Though my issue is I can't think of an alternative. Can you think of an alternative to that? Because doesn't there have to be some originating source? And that thing created what we are experiencing. And if we are to, you know, go back or, what, or to get out of this particular, because I've got a, an issue with the amount of pain and suffering here. That's my main thing is I don't understand. Well, I, and the, the way like eating works and death and, and just the weakness and mortality of our bodies. Like if I was the creator, I would have created a much more pleasant experience. And I don't understand why we're all here experiencing such a negative experience so i don't necessarily want to not be anymore like oh i don't want to be eric anymore i don't want like i actually like who i am um and if to just go back to source if that's what it was it seems like well you just create a new being because that's what source is doing it's sourcing all these beings and th then that sounds like yet another reincarnation trap 
just a bigger version of it, if that's what it is. And so I'm very curious about what could the alternative yeah, to that be? Because you've presented that, that you've actually thought that there could be some other thing. What else could could there be besides that? Well, if we if we put this and we'll put this in Gnostic and Cathar terms, right? That's that's the easiest kind of to explain out of Western minds. We can do this through Asian stuff too, but it's a little more tricky for the, the average person watching this. But so in Gnostic terms, they talk about a realm known as the Pleroma, which is a place of I guess the best way to describe it easily, it's just absolute. It's just an absolute reality. So there are actually no opposites. There can't, good can't exist because bad can't exist. There's literally this, this, and that's of course beyond our thinking. We can't, we can't, regular mental thinking can't really think of an absolute reality, but that's how they described it. This reality, the thing we exist in, and all of its layers, all of its universes, all of its dimensions, is a, um, they described it as a, like an, an, an error, a mistake, mm -hmm. that there weren't really creations happening in this Pleroma. There were, uh, and again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing Gnostic terminology. It's not easy to do. It's very challenging and it's very challenging. I'm actually reading it in Coptic now, actually doing the translation myself out of the Coptic. Mm -hmm. And that's, I'm finding when you look at normal translations of it, once you go from the Coptic, it's really different. But uh it's um they 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 kind of describe them more just like there were filaments of light that were created mm. so if you think of if you think of these early deities like if you want to think of a christ or sophia or whoever they're just these filaments of light that aren't really creating anything they just kind of they're having an experience in the totality but it's not an experience it's very weird to describe but somewhere within this they try to pin it on sophia they try to pin the problem on something feminine but i wouldn't put it in those terms it's just somewhere somehow there was an error or there was a mistake or there was a bad piece of coding or something and in that bad piece of coding that that part of the totality decided i want to create i want to actually create an equivalent to the place i'm currently in so it kind of tried to copy uh it tried to make a copy of where it was but the copy became kind of like if you if you if you put your you know you have something bad on the one disk and you put it on the stick and you move it on the other computer that problem's going to continue into the new system and that's what this is this is the problem from the old system or the old place beginning to magnify beginning to get bigger and bigger and bigger so the issue is you're dealing with two sources you're dealing with source which kind of doesn't create actually mm. and then you've got this source, which is manifesting this whole higher reality, which does create. And um, so they're kind of two different things. And that was one of the biggest understandings I started to unravel is that when creation is being discussed in ancient texts, they're actually talking about two completely different creations. And that began to make sense that there's, yeah, there's this creation and then there's a different creation. And as that began to unravel, it became, uh, okay, I, I, I'm kind of getting, because again, it's all another trick. As a lot of people out there know, you know, I used to, I've called this place for a long time, a suffering pit of hell. That's been my description for this place. And I'm softening it in my new book. I'm now calling it a pit of distortion, <clears throat> of which suffering is one of the major distortions. Because when I call it suffering, it actually limits the viewpoint of looking at this reality but as soon as i call it it's a it's a realm of distortion and suffering is part of the distortion the opportunity to look at this whole reality expands and that's kind of what i want to do now i kind of i got a little um and i felt i needed to to get like you say get a little push in there but now we need to we need to turn the corner a little bit and look at things a little softer and that's that's where i'm going to move with what i'm writing is but 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 bigger, softer, but expand what you're looking at, expand what you're what you're exploring. And um because if if someone still like you like someone like someone doesn't understand what Eric just said, like how could any true creator who's supposed to be loving create a mess like this? There's no answer for that. That that's that, those that's a literally impossible correlation. 
But once you know, once you see, ah, it's been created exactly the way the creator wanted to create it. It's ex- it is what the creator wanted. Ah, the creator's insane mm-hmm. of this realm. The creator's mm-hmm. insane. Ah, it all makes sense. Like it all makes sense now. Why it is the way it is, and why this bizarre trick and distortion is being being put on everything that's in it makes sense. What do you think would be the reason that a uh, um, the original source in the Pleroma, whatever you would call that, would allow Sophia to mm-hmm. have the demiurge and to create this world if if he's right. the ult- ultimate god and and something below him is creating something that he doesn't like, say, um, what's preventing him <clears throat> from squashing it and bringing us all back to the Pleroma? My suggestion would be this totality is not really omnipotent like we like to think it is. Mm. It it can't, um, and I'll describe it this way. When you're sitting on the couch with a brand new lover that you have, you've been with them for like three or four days. It's really early in the relationship, right? Everything they do is fantastic. It's it's that the moments on the couch are terrific. It doesn't matter what else is going on anywhere. Literally, it just from the worst thing coming on the news to whatever you just you're literally in such a clear place. You want nothing to change. Mm. No matter no matter how weird or something might be externally, your space on that couch with that person is so perfect. The idea of wanting to change anything doesn't even compute. I think it's something similar to that. It's more like this totality might re- recognize error. And at some point, you might say, they will get bored on the couch finally. And they'll just finally decide to turn off the TV. Let's put it that way, which I think is coming. I think we're getting close to having the simulation turned off, like I've mentioned many times. But I think it's that sense of like in such in such perfection, in such stillness, it it doesn't it seems insane to us being in it, but outside of it, it might just more seem like a kind of just like an annoyance or just mm-hmm. like a, a minor irritation. But to those of us in it who are actually experiencing technically type of hell, um, yeah, we want out. So I, I, I think there's also a completely different viewpoint to how the perception in and the perception out. Mm. So from a Gnostic perspective, then, are we trying to go back to the Pleroma? Is that what ending the reincarnation soul trap looks like? And then who are we if we were to do that? <laughs> are we even right. are on par with Sophia, for example, that can still exist in the Pleroma? Or are we as created beings, you know, a couple levels removed, potentially, um, expunged upon the extinguishment of this reality what are we if we're not part of this abomination (laughs) there's a good question i'm going to leave we should leave that one for the viewers so that they Mm. can have an opportunity to think about what eric just asked asked it's an extremely good question let's see what kind of comments we get Mm. let's see what people say to that first let's kind of You know, because we can do this again in a couple of months and uh, sort of catch up with where comments on a question like that led us. And so we can we can respond to here's what you said and here's our here's here's how we see it from what you presented, because it's nice. I think it's nice sometimes in these things to give the viewers sometimes too an opportunity to go. "Hmm, Good question. What would I say to that? Mm. All right. Let's present another one that might end up the same way. So with the idea of, of a soul trap and potentially us being, let's say, the source. So like if I'm the character in the dream and I realize, oh, the real me is the dreamer. And then so say we we die and we go through these we go through the light and then there's the beings of light and a judge and a 15 foot tall Jesus and whatever else presents it to us or presents itself to us. Wouldn't all of those things also be us, just in a different form? From that expanded per- perspective, if 
I'm not Eric and you're not Howdy and we all are technically this one originating source, which you said that, you know, that might not be the case. But following that line of thought, if that was the case, then I would intuit that every being of light, every deceased relative or whatever that you see along the way is yet another dream character, meaning yet another piece of you that's there influencing you in some way and if it's to come back here then it would be you coercing and manipulating yourself to be reincarnated in, into a soul trap it's like it would be our own thing and to get out of it you just have to realize that you are every piece coming to convince you of something else so when the being of light says oh you're a bad boy or you really you have to go back to earth to relive your karma you know <laughs> you're just me in another body trying to get me to go back there. Ah, no, no. And then somebody else comes. And if at every angle you just see yourself trying to change your mind, but your mind won't be changed, I don't, I don't know where that leaves you. What would that end up as? Or would you be like a hungry ghost at that point? Because you're not accepting any of these afterlife things. And so they just... You know, you just end up being um, a disembodied soul that does that wanders around, not knowing what to do. Well, if you're going from that perspective, and that that's a perspective that a lot of um, a lot of traditions present, and it's it, it, in a sense, it is a true perspective. I, I can't say that it that would be a false perspective, right? Because it's very clear that it comes out a lot. This idea of unity, I'm everything. Uh, which on one side is true, on one side is false. They're 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 two, but they're paradoxically two completely opposite things are true, uh, and each one are paradoxically false to each other. It's very bizarre. But from that side of it, right? If that's the state of awareness that someone is in, that it's all just okay. So if they're in the state of awareness, it's all just me. Let's say that's the state of awareness you're in, then. The first step should be, well, then, what is there? What is there I need to do? Really, what, what what would I need to do? Because I'm just interacting more with myself. If you know yourself, you don't need to interact anymore. Mm -hmm. So that would be the question: Do I actually know myself? If you didn't know yourself, then you, you're probably going to get curious and you're going to get drawn in. Well, this image here, this projection here, this, uh, you know, I need to know more. And of course, that will draw you in deeper and deeper. But from that perspective, somebody would then say, well, I don't know myself. So I'm going through more and more and more experiences with myself to know myself. That's how that side would probably answer such a question. On the other side of it, they would say that none of it is none of it is you. And so all of it is a gigantic trick, right? That from the side of nothingness, there is actually nothing. So all of it, as soon as you have a, as soon as you have anything, you're already being tricked. So it's this bizarre two-sided two um, pathway that um, you kind of have to touch both sides, but never hold both sides fully as being the answer. Uh, and again, these are all my opinions, people, right? These are all my, these are just theses that we're sharing. Uh, from, 30 years of doing this, that doesn't mean I got all the answers or I know everything or I think whatever I say must be true. These are just ideas for you to think about. Right? These are just to make sure everybody is clear on that, that you don't just take my words and run with them and say the guy in the blue shirt knows everything. No, I don't. <laughs> I, I like to listen to others that I think it uh, knowledge as well. But that that's where you would start to begin i think your your examination when you start asking the kind of questions eric is asking is you're you're saying okay what if this side of the examination is true how would that indicate let's call it the interaction between the me thing and the things which are me in other forms and then paradoxically with the other side how would i interact with you know things that are not me knowing that they're not me um, so it, it takes some time to kind of just allow yourself to swing to both sides, to view both both parts of the um, to view both parts of the uh, paradox, 
and sort of be in both, but not totally in one at the same time, if that makes any sense. Mm. If I'm not, yes, I'm not all the dream characters and I'm the dreamer and I'm the source and this is all kind of emanating out from me and I'm Eric is down here, but the, the ultimate Eric is the one that started all the dream and all the dream characters. If that's not what's going on, what, you know, what I would love to be going on is that I, the Eric, not this source thing, but me with my current memories, uh, emotions, thoughts and everything, after I die, they say that you're able to move at the speed of thought and that you can feel and hear the thoughts and, of everyone around you. It seems like you gain these kind of superpowers, these supernatural powers, and people are quick to relinquish them by going into the light and talking to the beings of light and having a life review and, and then they're back in a new body or something. But it seems like once we're out of these bodies, these are like a limiter or something. It limits our ability, our, some of our abilities, for example, ability of movement, because um, you can just think and you're there. Now, if, what if, what if when we die, we are, we come into a, a greater power and we are our own creator beings in the sense that we could create another world, a better world, a world that I envision, you know, I say, oh, I don't like the way that things have to eat each other to survive here. I don't like that your memory seems to be erased every time you're reborn. I don't like the pain and suffering. I have all these negatives, and then there's all positives that I do like, you know. Um, what if I was able to create my own heaven and then live in that? That sounds pretty cool. Is, is that an option? Is that, I don't, I, my issue with that one is I don't see how I could still be me and have all those powers. It seems like I would have to go back to source to get those source powers. And then, as I said, then I'm just going back in this new reincarnation cycle where you go back to source and then source, the thing source is doing is this dream, whatever, it created earth and all these people. So why would I not then be recycled back again? Even if I stayed as that, what is that even doing this whole time? Apparently, it's not helping out. Like you said, it might not be omnipotent. Uh, it is just blissing out on its own and not even caring all, all the stuff that's happening down here. Um, is there a uh, potential in your mind that we ourselves, in this state that we uh, our consciousness finds itself, outside of our bodies after death, could be now a creative being? And we can create a new experience and a new place and a life to live after that, or are we part of something bigger that we just can't escape from? And that's wishful thinking. Sure. If you, after someone dies, they can, they can just like now you can met technically you can manifest. If you know what you're doing, you can manifest anything you want. Mm. The problem is it's all still fake. Mm. So what's the difference? Mm. You know, you're, you're changing, you're changing, um, you're changing props in the theater show. Did it really, does it really make any difference? So we say, well, it's a nicer experience. Yeah, okay. And that's what that's what 95 more, 99.9% .9 of people want. They want a nicer experience. They want to make their they want to make their prison cell look better. That's what mm -hmm. they want. The prison cell is very uncomfortable. So I'm not so it doesn't bother me that I'm in prison. What bothers me is that I don't like it. So if you can find a way to make it nice, great. Then then they'll they'll be comfortable for a long, long time. Problem is still in prison and that's the part that very few people grasp or when they do and they come to bump into someone like me and they kind of realize you know like and, and again i would have no qualms against somebody doing that if that's what they wanted again it's so many people have come to me over the years and they're they're very confused right they're very i don't know what to do or and i would say that's your first that's your first question know what you want Know what you really, really want, because that's going to dictate everything you do, and it'll actually make your life easier. And and well, for me, the idea of making my prison cell nicer is like just something I couldn't even possibly contemplate. For someone else, that might be exactly what they truly want. They want a comfortable, nice thing with certain experiences, and it's like then 
put your put your effort into that. I tell people like really, re, like we talked earlier, redefine your intention really, really clear and go get it. You can. Every everything is actually possible if your intention is clear, and then you you walk like if somebody wants to be a professional golfer, what do they have to do? When they're like ten, they got to decide I'm going to be a golfer, and they realize how many hours a week do I have to play? Uh, what kind of clubs do I need? What kind of teachers do I need? And then you just golf, 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 read, read, golf, read, golf, golf. And that's what you do. And if you have enough talent and you put it together, it'll happen for you. But it's the literally. They weren't saying, I'm going to be a golfer and I'm going to be a mathematician and I'm going to be a stock car thing and I'm going to be a fireman. No, that's it. And that's what it is for just about anything. The, it's the intention that's your first clue as to where you're going to go. And in <clears throat> as those who are very good in the astral realm, who are very good at out of body know, when you're in that state, you don't really have to work hard. You think it, manifest. Like it's quick. It's like in a dream. You think it, you manifest it. So you you can do all of that, and and that is that is totally an option. But if someone says I want to end the reincarnation cycle, that won't do it, because like you say, you're just you're producing another place for your awareness to play. You might say, right? And um, so it's it's all about intent. It's all about first intention. Then it's about then it's commitment. It's it's having the intention and then it's putting putting the commitment in place to get whatever it is that you feel that you want. Because if your commitment is strong, you'll overcome a lot of adversity that's automatically going to get thrown at you. We we know. Ask anybody who does those what else those New Year's Eve resolutions. I'm going to start working out every four times a week. I'm going to quit smoking. How long does that last? Mm -hmm. Two weeks, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't have a true commitment. They don't have a true underlying, true emotional state of this is why it's not just I want to do this. I have to do this. They know like like when the mom or the dad is kind of realizing and they're smoking and drinking and they realize they're eight year old kid and they look at the kid and they say, if I keep doing this, I'm not going to be at their wedding. I'm probably going to be dead. I better stop. They have some kind of emotional impetus beyond just a wish and they're able to say, I'm done. Like and it's instant, right? It's in they, they they literally they don't have they don't have to be gradual in something like that. It's like when I stopped drinking myself, I stopped exactly 25 years ago. It was instantaneous. I said I don't want to do this anymore. Done. That's the way it has to be for a true intention. And once you've got your true intention, whatever it may be, the pathway will start to move for you because you are so clear within yourself. This thing anyway what you want so yeah it's, it's so be careful what you intend because make sure it's what you really want because you can intend you can have an intention and it can take you to some place and then you get there and say actually i didn't want this mm. so know what you want first so you would say that even if you were able to be the ultimate creator and designer of your own reality which you designed uh in only with aspects that you wished for nothing negative in your <clears throat> in your view everything's just positive you would still consider that a prison yes of course and one why and two what would be the alternative to that that wouldn't be a prison um if if you were just to be nothing is that what is nothing is like void and having no consciousness and no experience whatsoever is that the goal um, or is the goal to have some other kind of experience that's not a created fictional experience, but a real experience because you are now being whatever the real thing is and you're not creating some false prison, as you'd say? Yeah, um, challenging to put into words, of course, this kind of idea, but it's kind of on that track. It's this um, it's this recognition of um, you want to be in a place where false doesn't exist. Yeah. That's the best way I could describe it. And so you can't go there because you don't know what it is. What you can do is locate false. Mm. We have lots of it around us. And you start dropping it. And you mm. start dropping it. And you start dropping it. And at the beginning, it's easy. Easy to find things that are false. As you go on, it gets a little harder. 
and they begin to get more personal and they begin to get things that you really like. You know, things you hate, they're easy to let go when you see they're false. Things you really love, those are harder to let go. But eventually you'll get to one thing and no matter how hard you try to get rid of it and prove that it's false, you can't. And that's how you realize, oh, that's what's true. Mm. And what's so bizarre when that happens is that um, it's never what you think it is. Well, we'll always have this idea of, oh, if I ever find the truth, it's going to look like this. It's going to have a particular package. It's going to, and usually people expect, um, uh, like, you know, trumpets will blow and angels will appear or whatever. They have, there's always some sort of something that people have. And the ones that I trust the most that have reached this actual total state, that's what they always put in their sharing is that. I never would have guessed it is what it is. And that's kind of how they know it had to be true because they couldn't have wished for it. They didn't even know that was a pot that what they found was a possibility. Because if if you that would be the, the other challenge. If if you found, and I hate using the word ultimate truth, but let's call it that just for the conversation. If you find something that's ultimate truth and it's exactly what you thought it would be, now you always have this problem of. How do I know that's ultimate truth and not a wished for, a really wished for manifestation that I made for myself? So it's always better that the end result is totally unexpected because then you know, well, I couldn't have wished for this. So um, this has to be it. So that's yeah, the other path is literally removing false. Just so it's people think the pathway is going forward that yes you do have an intention yes you have it but the intention isn't the goal the intention is the pathway that you're going to walk but the real pathway is backwards in a sense away from yourself removing more and more and more until you might say you bump into what's true it's kind of like by accident boom oh this this is what it is so everybody's going this direction they're trying to go forward into into something and the actual answer is going backward into a surprise hmm. wow so if you say you found yourself on your deathbed rising out of your body tunnel of light light beings would you process and then I'd, that? I'd, be, I'd, I'd, I'd be getting i'd be getting reincarnated because that's you've already gone too far at that point that's what the Tibetan Book of the Dead basically says, like, you, you get this point right after death to accept the clear light, which I assume is like mm -hmm. your co consciousness mm -hmm. or something. And then if you if you don't get it at that point, it's like you just fall into deeper and deeper states of delusion, which will give you worse and worse reincarnations. So, so that you resonate with that. Eric has just given you a very important clue, people. I hope you just heard that right. Now, that doesn't mean, because the Tibetan Book of the Dead continued, it didn't just stop at that point. It didn't just say, because that's what technically Dzogchen Buddhism is doing. Dzogchen Buddhism is trying to teach the student now how to be in this clear light state, you might say, constantly, so that when you die, you're first in, it's automatic. You just, you're in this clear light and you begin your process, right? It's instant. But if for whatever reason that doesn't happen, now you've got a lot of work to do. Mm. And by doing certain things now you can avoid a massive amount of work in the after death state it doesn't mean it, you couldn't liberate yourself at that point in time but like the tibetan book of the dead then goes on for a very long period of time it's a lot of work so yeah that so yeah answering your question if i was in that that place where you described me i'd be like well, i got a little <laughs> i got a little work now mm. you know that I, I missed i missed the doorway so well, better get better get working and so it's useful to prepare yourself for the possibility of this whole long potential after death work state. But the the preferred choice would be you've done what you have to do now so that, yeah, it's it's a pretty quick transition. Yeah. I wonder with the transition, if if you have relinquished all material desires and attachments and wanting to be a creator like i said or whatever and, and mm -hmm. what what you really are focusing on is what you've said which is negating all falsehoods and and that's your yep. work 
seems like mm-hmm. you would you would need to do that before you die if if you are to be in that state in that that pivotal moment that we're talking about so so does all of this actually have to be done now while we're living and it's not really like um something that we have to oh now it's go time when you're dead you, you gotta do it no go time is this whole life and this is your opportunity right. to not be reborn is what you do now there you go there's there's the there's the comment that's why a lot of people have asked me you know if this is such a bad place why don't we just kill ourselves and I, I try to remind you, you know, suicide is not going to help you because all it's going to do is propel you. It'll take you out of your current suffering now. OK, but it's just going to propel you into the next uh, to the next de- after death realm. And you're not ready for it. Mm. You know, actually, you're not prepared for it. So all that's going to happen is you're going to get sucked up and guaranteed you're back into another dreamlike experience. So you actually didn't gain anything because this is the time where work can actually happen. Mm. It's the bizarre thing. The, the material body is the heaviest of the bodies. It's the most painful of the bodies. It's the it's the most difficult to be in. But strangely, it offers the most possibility for, because of that, figuring out truths and letting go of false. It's much easier to let go of false here than it is in the after in the after death state. So yeah, this is this is when the work happens. So it's that's so I've told some of these people I, I, I'm sure so many but like many people are suffering. Like okay, I've had trauma, I've had difficulty in my life, but compared to some of the people that I know or been in contact with, I mean, I'm like four out of ten life compared to them being like eight or nine out of ten. Like you know, just living a a very difficult, messy, horror filled life, and and I I have gr- huge empathy for those who've had to live through it, but it's even through all of that difficulty and and the seeing or the potential seeing that's given you what's one more thing you can do now to prepare yourself if you're saying i don't want to have to do this again i don't want to take the chance i may have to do this again then your time to your time to make that happen is now and not waiting for some time in the future it's like it, it's now do it you can do your work so give yourself like literally every extra day you get like someone says are you happy to be alive well not really but i'm glad to still be here from the standpoint of finish the work i have to do and maybe share a little bit with someone else that it might be of value to them that at some point and that, that, that what i've shared and what we've talked about and what i've written is has some value beyond that um no like it's not like i'm i get much enjoyment out of this place because I know, I know the deception that everything is. So because I know it's it just it's a constant series of, it's a, it's like being in a game show, and the whole game show is just, and 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 the game show is is figuring out the game show. You don't even know what it is, right? It's not even like you start day one and they explain the rules to you, and you know here's how you go and here's how you be win be the winning contestant. Well, they don't tell you any of that. They just throw you in the game and you have to actually figure out the game before you can even figure out what you're doing. It's it, it, it's such a bizarre reality we've been thrust in and so few people want to think about it. That's even still, it blows my mind how few people will actually pull up a is really uh, I'm sure many of you can recognize Eric and I are not having a spiritual conversation, even though it might sound like we're having a philosophical conversation. We're having a conversation about the absolute depth of what's going on. What is this place? How did it get here? Why did it get here? What is death? I mean, these are literally should be the prime conversations of everyone's life. And for most people, they are. not And again, that just kind of blows my mind that that it's not. On the flip side, I recognize that because this is a realm of distraction and it does a great job of doing that. So as soon as you've got two kids and you've got the job and you've got to cook dinner and you've got to take them to soccer practice and you've got to do this and you've got to, do, there's no time. Mm. So many people literally do not even have time for, for them uh, to even have the time to like watch our interview today they have to almost schedule this time in because they're, the rest of it is so busy. I, I mean, I get that. So I get why for many people it's so difficult. But on the other hand, it's like even still people don't say, I wished I had more time to study this stuff. Generally, they would just say, I wish I just had more time to do things that I, I like to do. So this conversation t- normally or 
good 95% of the population just wouldn't appear even if they had the time to have it. Mm. As so, I'm sure you know in your own life, right? You, there's not many people you could just strike up a conversation like this. Um, it's rare who you could talk to about this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've always been deeply philosophical. I majored in philosophy in college. And so it's always been the way I've thought. But I've always been the black sheep loner <laughs> that, that you know nobody understands. And like you say, um, I love to talk yeah. about deep topics and most people love to stay on the surface and the second you, you scratch anything too deep they're they're out of there now yeah if if the work yeah and, and people want to know why that is it's because there's so many things that are built into the identity of who i am religion uh, ideas about history or science or what you're supposed to do or i mean all of these things are part of a foundational structure and if they start, if you start pull, picking at one of those foundations, it's not so much they're worried about that specific one. They're worried if on a subconscious level, if one of the foundations go, maybe they all can go. Mm. And if all the foundations go, then I won't know who or what I am. And I'll just I'm just going to hold on whether it's true or not. I don't care. It gives me some it gives me a solidity. So I'm going to hold on. Um, a game you can play with people if you want to just see how this is, because one of the things I, I did through my whole life, too, along with recapitulation, was not doing, which was behaving in opposite, bizarre, strange ways to test how my mind works and how others work. Fun thing you can do is go see people who know you really well. So this would be like family members or really close friends and just behave the opposite as you normally do. Whatever you normally talk about talk about something else however you normally sit sit a different way um if you don't ever drink rye whiskey when you're there ask for rye whiskey like literally you just and watch the reaction the people are going to be freaked out because you're not behaving the way their mind has decided this is you mm. and you this is the box i've built for you and as soon as you start playing outside of the box they don't know what to do they literally, you know, like you would act normally, you'd have to only do that for about 20 or 30 minutes and you'd have to stop because you literally you'd freak them out. And so it's similar. So you understand what's going on when you start having a heavy conversation. It's something similar. They have a box of themselves that they've built over years and they don't want to start wondering, I could be different than the box. So maybe mm -hmm. that gives people an understanding of why why you're going to meet so many walls if you try to have these discussions with average people. Yes. Yeah. Most people, they get comfort from their stock answers that they get from religion or wherever else. And they believe in those answers, whether they're true or not, whether they can um, confirm or deny the accuracy of their mm -hmm. beliefs is a whole nother thing. But someone who's truly right. philosophical, like like we're doing, is doing the work that you just said, which is basically seeing what isn't. And that if you're always seeing what isn't, you don't, you know, if people ask me, what's your philosophy? Or, or even when people ask me, you know, about this soul trap type thing, I'm, I've always said I'm agnostic. I don't, I don't know. And I, and I think everyone else is too, but everyone else is deluded into thinking there's something beyond agnostic. I mean, agnostic means to not know. And I'd say right. every single one of us is in that same boat. None of us know, right. but the vast majority of people think they do know. They've found some answer from some religious book right. or from some guru or, or what have you. And th right. then they, they've they convinced themselves this is the answer. And they spend their whole life trying to convince everyone else that that's the answer. And if they come across right. someone philosophical who is all about you know, breaking down those walls and questioning and finding, you know, things that don't work in your belief. Yeah, you're going to run away. That's not going to be a comfortable conversation. That does away with the, the whole reason that you had that belief, which is it gave your life some kind of structure. Like you said, that box, it's, it's comforting to live inside the box rather than outside in this, you know, this jumble of mystery and confounding confusion that we actually find it. That's what everyone actually is in. But that's difficult to stay in that space of just absolute mystery. But I, I haven't found myself any, I, I, don't, I don't feel like I've gotten any closer to the absolute truth. Just like you say, I just have 
oh no, this isn't it. This is that's what's gotten me to this soul trap thing. Is just like, right. well, that, that's not it. That's not. And I'm um, just coming here, and then let, people ask me like, so how did you conclude this? It's like, well, this isn't even a conclusion. It's just all this other stuff definitely isn't it. Yeah. And this is kind of where I'm at now. Yeah. This is a, this is a possibility. So now I examine this thing. Yeah. It's mm. that. It's it it's the uh, story of the they say the more you learn right the less you know and what that right. really means is actually when you're not really learning you're like I say you're letting go of false so of course mm -hmm. as you let go of false it doesn't mean truth comes to replace it it just means less than you're carrying less and less and less so actually the further you go you know less because you're you didn't gain a whole bunch of knowledge but you let go of all this previous stuff that you realized that like you say that's not it. That's not the answer. It can't be this. But that's the weird thing. Nothing instantly replaces it. So there's just these gaping holes of, of unknown. And the further you go, the more you have to get comfortable with this state of, yeah, I just actually I don't know. And I'm OK with that. I'm OK with not knowing. I'm willing to be patient and wait. Um, <clears throat> that was that that was taught to me so early on. There was a, a medicine man that I went to see for the first time. I was told. Uh, that this, this person might be willing to go and, and spend some time with you. So, okay, I went out to, I, I called him, let him know I was coming. I went out to the reserve, came to his house. He said, hello. He gave, he showed me a chair. He didn't give me anything. Didn't give me any food, didn't give me water. Just I just sat on the chair. He went and did his stuff. He made phone calls. He collected herbs. People came over. I sat there for six or seven hours. I just sat there. And I was wondering, Am I supposed to do something? Is he angry that I'm here? Should I leave? But, and I kind of just said, I said, you know, I'm going to ride this out. If it takes like four days, I'm just going to ride this out until he acknowledges one way or another. You no, know, get the hell out of my house. Or I just mm -hmm. sat there. Mm -hmm. And late in the afternoon, he finally just looked at me and said, okay, come back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. He was testing me. He was mm -hmm. testing me. Could I just be patient? Could I, could I wait? Did I need to have something happen immediately? And from their tradition, from the native tradition, that's that's very important that you have to you have to give time to what they would call the spirits, right? Whatever that really means, but you have to give them time to to bring the knowledge to you. It might not be now, and you have to be patient. And that was that's a powerful actually it's a powerful tool to be comfortable that in this way we're talking here, I can be in this state of not knowing, and it's okay. I'll be patient knowing may appear tomorrow or next week or next month or whatever no i'll wait now uh, you said that uh like the work kind of needs to be done while we're alive because at the moment of death if you don't you know receive the clear light uh in that moment then you know it's just gonna go downhill from there would you say that the main work that we should be doing is what you call recapitulation or would some of the other things that I mentioned, do, do those even register for you? Like the meditation, out-of-body experiences, lucid dreaming. Do you think trying to get familiar with that is useful at all? And um, what is your actual definition of recapitulation? What should we be doing um, if, if that's the okay. thing that we're, we're, we're trying to focus on? Sure. First answer, all of them. Yes, all, all, all possible exercises are valid and useful potentially. And you don't really know which ones will work until you've tried them. Um, some people, you know, some people get upset because they've tried meditating and they can't do it or they did. And it's like, so they, they feel like, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. And I, I can't, it just doesn't work for me. So I guess I'm, I have no chance. And once you explain to them, like, well, there's a whole lot of other exercises. There's all these other stuff. They take you to the same place, just on a slightly different road. And do you think you can do th these, this, this, and this? Yeah, I can do that. And their their demeanor changes right away because it's like, oh yeah, there's many different things I can do. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of different possibilities, and you kind of have to try a number of them to see which one seems like a you can do and are providing and are providing value for you. And it's okay to say no to the ones that everybody else is doing. You don't have to do those. You have to do the ones that's right for you, right? So that's the first question. The second thing Eric asked is about specifically the recapitulation and, and what that is, at least for me, because I never, I didn't really understand it until I had completed it. 
which is which is a life review and it took me four and a half years to do it and it wasn't until the end that i kind of actually figured out why this why this works what this actually does because when you're in the midst of it you just don't get it actually but the point being is that you want to see your life in complete detail from the standpoint eventually of feelings we we have a package of our life based on uh, psychological memories that's normally how we relate to our past as opposed to what did we what were we feeling what was the emotion that tends to get hidden so that's one thing you're wanting to unlock in the course of the recapitulation is finding the feeling as opposed to just a psychological uh, ramification of it the second thing you're doing is you're watching for the incredible repetitive patterns of life um because <clears throat> that was something that just blew my mind when i started doing it is how many like days weeks months years were literally just it was like it's the same thing just played out again and again and again and again like a record it was like it was staggering to see the and, and shocking to see the unbelievable repetitiveness that was my life that's another thing that the recapitulation is revealing at the deepest core it's re again like i've said earlier it's 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 getting you to ask well who am i supposed to be now if i don't if i no longer can believe the story of my past the easiest way for anyone to start if someone says oh, i'm interested in trying this um if you want to see the complete detail uh, i actually have on my website there's literally like a i don't know an eight page document of Here's at least how I did my recapitulation to the course of my life. So you can go there and read it. But step one, simplest thing to do is start writing out a list of everybody you've ever met in your life. Like literally everybody. Maybe not like the guy who gave you the French fries at McDonald's when you were 12. But if you had any kind of potential conversation with somebody, at least, they should go on the list. That should take you a month or two months to actually put that together just to comb through your life all of these people that you interacted with that you had you know some sort of conversation with and this would include animals that you've known uh, i mean not just people right it's like literally the the interactions of, of your of your life just doing that alone that two or three months is a is a type of recapitulation because so many things will start to come up and what, you, what you're looking for, in the recap, even in this point of the recapitulation, is memories to come up that you have forgotten. That's that's one of the big things, is these things that will appear that it's like, how did I ever, this is so important, how did I forget this? Mm. Why did I forget this? And that's a big part of the recapitulation, is unlocking all of these pieces of your past that, that our mind has compartmentalized. We still have access to them, it's just... They put them in a in a uh, in a locked door, and our subconscious knows they're there, but we have no conscious memory of them. So recapitulation is eventually pulling up the stuff that's opening all the locked doors, and um, that that's your first step. That's literally your first step. And then if somebody wants to go further and actually do the process, it's like I said, I, I listed it there because it's um, it's just something that was so helpful for me. So I'm happy to share that with with others, but. You know, like I say, even even to just make a list of everyone you met will be will take you longer than you think it will. Yeah, I'd imagine so. And then to go back and try and think of everything that you've done that. And are you specifically trying to look at negative events? Does it matter the, all the positive events? Are you supposed to look at those as well? Everything. everything, everything, literally everything with the idea being that at the beginning for a long time you're going to be looking at the events like almost like you're watching a movie so it's like you'll be here and then you'll be in the movie and you're watching the conversation at the restaurant and the way you'll see it that way mm -hmm. it it makes a change at some point in the practice and it might take quite a while when all of a sudden you're now in the scene <clears throat> in it you're not watching it anymore it's like literally you're in the chair again, you're looking out, you're, it's like literally you're reliving it in your physical body one more time. So now the emotions, because while you're still watching it, it's a, you're still separate from the emotions. Once you're reliving it from inside of it, everything can be felt and noticed again. And it's just, it's just, uh, yeah, it's, 
it's incredible to see how much we missed when mm. it was going on. There's a, a yeah. similar practice in Reiki where they go through every year of their life, starting from one, two, three, yeah. and you're supposed to try to remember anything that you can remember or anything that you know about that period of your life and then to relive it in a sense. And then because it's Reiki, they, they like put their hands on chakras and they're like forgiving themselves for certain things and trying to make realizations with their current self and their new perspective, looking back on childhood trauma or, or other things that happened and hopefully, mm. you know, rewiring certain things um, and coming out a better, better person or more knowledgeable. Um, but your version, and that would be a, you know, to help your psychology to deal with childhood trauma so that you become a happier person. Your version mm -hmm. of recapitulation isn't trying to be a psychologically more positive person. Is, is the purpose to not be deluded after death by these, these life review people? Is, is that the main, what is the main purpose of, of your version of this? Yeah, some some might use it for that. I've said that's a possibility of why somebody could choose to do it, but I can only speak for how it worked for me, right? I, I first bumped into these teachings through early Carlos Castaneda books, and I read them and thought, this, this sounds interesting, I'm going to do it. And then when I talked to some of my native teachers, then they kind of refined it, kind of, they do things, but in a, a quite different way. That was one of the great things I had, because when I would I had read Carlos Castaneda stuff, and I knew it was not true, let's say. It's him or other people or whoever wrote these books putting ideas into a story. So it was great when I actually got to meet the real people who live on the reserves and actually, you know, and I could compare. What of this seems like it's similar and what's completely different? And so, so they helped me also shape how I was looking at the recapitulation. But again, the point was first to see the way... See, the way like the, the way you described first, uh, this other uh, technique of doing it, which it does have some value, like you say, it will help you psychologically to do that. But it, you can you could see that it's really it's it's the mind is going to present its story. The mind is presenting the story and then you're going to work with the story to try to bring it into such a way that where it's a, it's a more effective interaction between the you thing and the story. Mm -hmm. Here, we're not interested in the mind story at all. We don't care what the mind thinks. We're interested in what really happened. Mm. We're interested in what happened at, at the level of the feeling. That's all that matters. And so, it, yeah, it's a little different because you're going into this depth of something else, really with the point eventually, at least it was for me, when I could look back on it and say, the story my mind told me about my life is absolutely 100% wrong. Mm. Usually whenever I thought somebody was being a complete idiot, it was me. Usually if I thought I was being a complete idiot, actually it was them. Like literally my whole life was the complete opposite of what I thought it was. Like, like to massive degrees. So when I came out of it, I actually, for a while, um, similar to what you could get out of out-of-body experiences or dream It's literally, I was like, well, I don't know who I am then. Mm. Because I, I had this whole belief of my whole life and how I was and how I acted and, you know, who are the things I, I should forgive? Who are the people I should get forgiveness from? And it was like, actually now, I don't know what the hell happened there. I have no idea. And so I all of a sudden was able to move into that state you're talking about. And actually now I don't know. Mm. And because I don't know, I'm no longer bound to have to respond to my past the way I've always responded to it. Doesn't mean the past has gone away. It just means actually the way I've always thought it is, I, at least I know that's not it. I've, I've got a probable answer, but even then it's not totally the same because I did a second life recapitulation a few years later. And when I did the second one, it was totally different because then instead of seeing a complete scene, like say I was at a uh, a hotel um, front desk checking in with say a girlfriend, we're doing something. No longer did I watch the whole thing play out. I watched one second in ultra slow motion. I was literally seeing like one tiny slice of the entire 20 minute interaction as if this one second was the only thing that mattered. The whole other 19 minutes and 59 seconds, that's just filler. 
That was literally, this is it. And so again, from that, it was this realization of the mind is building this massive, giant structure over what's really these tiny little energetic events. And if we can, if we can let go of this story, right, if we can let go of this howdy guys here talking to Eric over there, what's really happening is one tiny energetic moment that's here that, and it's like, that's really what you need to find or what we need to zero in on. What the Howdy and Eric character have done or talked about means little. If you could zero in literally on, well, what's the energetic element that was the part of this whole seeming interaction between the two of them? And if you could literally find that and pull it out, you don't need to hear the whole conversation we just had. You could literally just zero in and you get it all instantaneously because that's where it's contained. That's what the second recapitulation began to show me is this that the story doesn't matter the little tidbit of the of the core energy of it that's where the whole thing is located so it again it just starts to change your whole perspective of this place and my interaction with it right it but it's also seemingly also bringing you to a place of not knowing of even more not knowing do you, do you think is that a, a, a good place to be because we're talking about how this moment of death, you need the clear light. If I'm still in my agnostic space of just not knowing and, well, this isn't it, this isn't it, this isn't it, oh, and I'm dead. Is that enough? Everyone else is doing, they're doing the opposite, basically. They're finding some answer and then they're having extreme confidence in the answer, like, Jesus, right. I'm going to heaven, or Buddha, I'm going to, you know, not be reborn, I'm yeah. going to go into the void or whatever. If you've got some solid, concrete, a confident idea of what you want do you think that do, do we need that because that's what everyone else is doing do i need to be confident about abc of the, the soul trap or whatever because i'm not i'm i'm in that space that that you're talking about right. where all i can ever do is say well that doesn't resonate well no i, I don't see anything that's a yes I don't have confidence in any answer that I can hold in my hands and be like, okay, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to intend, even the intention word. So we're saying you have to intend. If I don't know what's exactly what's going to happen at death, how, how can I have any kind of confidence or intention? Like I'm not going to be born again. Here's what I'm going to do. I don't even have that kind of confidence. What I have is skepticism. I have this forever skepticism and i'm hoping that that will be what saves me this is the fact that everything that comes at me i'm going to be skeptical i'm not going to accept it and that has been what's i i feel a, a boon to my life in this world by being constantly skeptical and a critical thinker that has gotten me way farther than what most other people do which is believing finding a comfortable answer and being totally confident with it even though you can't even prove it uh, so I'm kind of worried about carrying this way of being into the afterlife because is that what I is or unless that's what is necessary. I, I just to extrapolate a little more. You've probably heard about Pascal's wager. The idea that, um, well, if heaven exists and the only thing you need to do is believe in Jesus, um, well, you might as well do it because then you get a free ticket to heaven. And if you know that wasn't true, you just, all you did was believe in something that wasn't real. And so there's no real downside to it. Um, my idea is, well, what if there is a downside to it? What if believing in something false gets you manipulated, tricked into, say, coming back here? And the only thing that wouldn't allow that is if you rejected everything and you were skeptical of everything. So in, in that version, maybe that is the savior. So it's the exact opposite of Pascal's wager. If you accept Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, any, any answer that you accept and you're waiting for that in the afterlife, maybe that's what the afterlife's gonna give you because that's what you're expecting. But if you have no expectations and all you have is skepticism, everything that's thrown at you in the afterlife is also gonna be approached with skepticism. And do you think, my question is, is that a good plan or should you try and find the answer while you're alive so that you could be oh, have it in the palm of your hand and then be confident about it like everybody else seems to be because i've never 
I've never been able to do that. I've never found any answer that's gotten rid of my constant agnosticism that I've felt ever since I've been alive. <laughs> Good question. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so if somebody holds a belief, certainly going into the afterlife, guaranteed they'll manifest it. That's what the belief is. That's what the astral world is, right? You have a belief or a feeling and it manifests it. So guaranteed that will be the experience. The, the afterlife will give you uh, will give you a, a package of what you expect. So if someone believes in, yeah, in any of these religious characters, that's what they're going to get. If somebody doesn't believe in that and they love dead grandma and whatever, well, they'll probably get dead grandma. If somebody really loved uh, the New York Yankees, they'll wind up with front row seats at Yankee games for the rest of their eternity. Like, whatever. They'll get something like that until it's time to bring you back here, right? Time to bring you back into the realm. So if somebody goes in with um no belief at all which of course is going to be challenging because we have we have so many foundational beliefs that we don't even know are beliefs so um but generally then somebody might at least be able to in that circumstance they're going to at least remain in a state of kind of stillness because they're gonna they're gonna question right away why should I trust this? Why should I trust this? Why should I trust you? Why should I go? So at least they're going to be still. They're not going to be pulled into any any belief structure. Um, but they're still, they would still be, um, they'd still be, right, you're still in the matrix. So you're still in it. So at some point, there would have to be an attempt to, even in the still place, even of rejecting all of that, to to at least come up with a this deeper understanding which comes from drop when all the false drops right when there's when there's um when it's revealed i can share this little tiny thing for people which might there's a clue in it and that's um uh i've done some work with somebody and and they created we created a stillness together like literally they were it was just 15 minutes right of just nothing and they finally just looked at because i kind of looked at them wondering you know, well, do you have a question? Or and he just looked at me and said, "I don't have questions." They just, you know, and he said, that "I've never in my life ever had a point where I didn't have a question." And I kind of said, "Yeah, there's, there's where you're headed." So, to even wonder what should I do next, you're kind of already going to get pulled into it. So it's there is a there is a there is a pathway and a place, I think, where you're you're going into this transition, potential transition state. Um, still, that would be the thing, going in still. But if you're going in, if you're definitely going in with a belief, guaranteed, 100 percent, you're going to get it. If someone's expecting the karmic committee and the life review, they're going to get it. If someone's expecting uh, hell and demons, they're going to get it. If someone, you know, whatever they expect, go to you believe you're going to get. So if you have, if you have, no, <clears throat> if you realize that, then that's back from my when I was testing reality. When I was playing, my mind is making, in some way, what's going on here. And my, and my, it's not all of it, of course. It's a, just a small part of it, but it is impacting it. When we start to realize that in the after death state, it has an even bigger impact. So it's have we learned to at least shut all that off so that we're not adding any external projection? Then at least you could say, OK, kind of what's coming at me. And like you say, just oh, I'm rejecting all of that. So you're not going forward. You can be still and you can maybe take 100 or 200 years figuratively to come to a deeper understanding. So in my opinion, I would suggest that's the better option of the two mm. right if you if you don't find an ultimate answer before you die but you're able to walk in and say actually i have no idea what this is really going to be like and i probably am not going to trust whatever's thrown at me you'll you'll have a better chance of navigation somewhere that's what the tibetan book of the dead is doing right the tibetan book of the dead and the egyptian one too if, if you know how to translate it it's it's sort of in its own way saying here's all the stuff that's going to get thrown at you and you kind of you just can't you can't believe it like you can't you can't be drawn to it either from out of want which is one side temptation desire or fear because the same thing if, it, if you fear something you are going to get drawn to it as well you're kind of you're 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 solidifying the the object right whether you fear it or you desire it so when there's none of those present 
there's just then there's just your awareness and this object thing, this this projection thing. And like, okay, kind mm. of so what? Um, it's it's um, I have that a lot now in my life, my day to day life with everything, and it's very strange for people to be around me because they're expects you know they'll bring up a subject or a topic or something that's going on around us or that, whatever. Don't you have an opinion on that? Well, no, actually, just. So what? Mm. And that's the part they can't get past that. They can't get past it. But, but, but can't you see the meaning or the problem or the whatever or the something that needs to be fixed? And I'm like, no, actually, I think that's the way it is. And especially when it's something difficult, you know, my first response: well, this is a realm of distortion and suffering. You know, that's how it's built. So don't be surprised that wherever you go, you find suffering. Mm-hmm. So. From that perspective, I guess the greatest um, philosophical piece that came across was Schopenhauer's writings when I came across it. He, Schopenhauer did not exit the matrix, guaranteed, but Schopenhauer did come up with the understanding, okay, if this is a world of suffering and a very Buddhist uh, intake into him, then the best way we can proceed is to reduce suffering for ourselves and others. And it, and you, if that's your first subject that, hey, the whole reality is suffering along with me. And if I can help one other person, one other dog, one other tree, one other anything to reduce their suffering, I've actually done something okay today. It's a pretty, it's a pretty good way to live your life just moment by moment. Um, and, and like I said, it happens all the time. I might notice a tree with a nail in it. And so my, my, literally my first response will just be, what should I do with the tree? And I might try to talk to the tree and figure because maybe it doesn't want the nail out. That would be worse. Maybe it does want me to take the nail out. Maybe it wants me to take the nail out and do some kind of repair on it. But the point being is I've seen another being in suffering. Can I find a way to help? Mm. I think that's from, from that perspective, what Schopenhauer presented is a brilliant indication and very Buddhist, right? Very Buddhist, but not coming from compassion, not like poor you and happy me that's compassion this is from empathy it's from i can feel your pain i can feel your suffering in this world of suffering we're in it together and i'm sharing some of my time and energy to make your existence a tiny bit better today Mm -hmm. that's just there what a great way to live absolutely I've, i've heard that there's two kinds of buddhism well i know there's two branches of buddhism but um i've heard that there's two ideas about enlightenment within it that there's one idea that one person can become enlightened and can say not be reincarnated Um, there's another idea that no one person could ever be enlightened or leave the the trap by themselves and that the only way to reach true enlightenment is for everybody to do it as if we're all part of some you know one consciousness or whatever and and for one of us to be like oh i'm enlightened well you can't be because you're part of this whole thing that's unenlightened and and the, the idea that you could be apart from it all by yourself enlightened is another falsehood i'm not sure both are where, true. where yes. i heard yeah, i'm not sure where i heard that yeah, idea both, both are true yeah interesting both 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 parts of that are true and when somebody is able to actually understand why both is well, because like you say, they sound opposite to each other. But when you see how both of them are actually true at the same time, it would be like, a, oh, one of those moments. Like, oh, of course. <laughs> it's it's paradoxical so truth. Another yeah, one. The paradox. So many of these things are really, that I've come, come to see now, they're really paradoxical. And that's part of the trap. The Part of the trap is saying that only one side of an equation can be true. Mm. The one, one side is true, one side is false, so you're always fighting which is the true side, which is the false side, and when you can start being, wait a minute, I think both sides are true. Oh, boy. The Matrix doesn't like when you start getting figuring that out <laughs> because duality starts to break down because duality is all about splitting. This is this side, and this is this side, and you know it's very obvious. And when you start saying, no, actually, it's one coin, and it's just two sides of the same coin, and it's just two different faces. Holy smokes! Mm. Then it's like then there's this this still point that can kind of 
bizarrely without mind wrap those two pair the paradoxes start to wrap together it's kind of what a, a cone is supposed to do in zen it's supposed to create an experience like that through these thinking of these stupid questions but um people the cone is supposed to be a very short period of time like it really is just supposed to do it for a little while to get your mind thinking on something else to then bring it to like a real paradox that's important like it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter about the tree falling in the forest right it's just, it's designed to get you thinking in a different way but then people spend 20 years thinking about it and you're like yeah okay you've worked on your cone but did you like figure out this paradox that eric and i'm talking about? well no well what did you accomplish then the tree falling in the forest doesn't make a sound if no one's there to hear it um i've thought like language and number seems to obscure us from the one reality in the sense of there's no two people no two trees no two rocks no two anything that are exactly alike but we use language to label things oh that's a tree this is a tree that's not a tree and then there's variations a pine tree a spruce tree different different types but even mm. none of the variations are exactly alike so no two pine trees are alike so at the ultimate reality there is no two there's not even any second thing when we try to label a human a tree a rock and then we oh here's another instance of rock here's another instance of rock but none of them are the same what does that label even mean and wouldn't the ultimate label then be the one thing which is everything all of us together you know the rock the tree the people everything that would be the only one thing that exists the big wow in the now but you can't even talk about it you know we couldn't exist in that state i can barely explain what i'm talking about in language but if that's the ultimate reality <laughs> we're just obscured from that constantly every time we open our eyes think a thought because it's all happening in language we're, we're, we're you know the pillow there's another pillow but they're they're two different pillows but i'm using the same word to describe two completely different things i feel like this entire reality is a paradox in that sense uh that you can never get to the underpinning of it because we're we're part of the pie we're a little slice of it trying to look at the whole the whole thing we're already baked yeah. into it yeah, my friend Norio Kushi always likes to say that the matrix is built on language. Mm. That language is the building block of this place. So it was back to without realizing it when I was stopping thought in order to stop language in my head. That's why the matrix began to stop because without language, without words, particularly internal dialogue, the place has a difficult time existing. Now, I don't want people to then think you're creating your whole reality, so you're responsible for everything. If something happened to you, you it's your fault or something like that. Uh, no, we we just like a hologram. You you project out one laser beam. You might say the reality itself puts out a second laser beam, and then the two laser beams meet, and we have the experience. So we're just projecting part of reality. We're not projecting the whole of reality. And that's an important thing to, to get across because the reality wants to get you to think it's your fault. But reality is built on guilt. Whatever's happened, it's your fault. Like literally, it doesn't matter what it is. Anywhere in the world, you know, an earthquake happens in Japan tomorrow and somehow the reality wants it. And it's your fault that it happened. You had this thought or this whatever. Remember five years ago? And it, literally, it's always trying. And it, it's just not. It's just not. We are literally just manifesting certain beliefs and ideas and experiences into an already built video game. The video game is very, very complete. We're just bumping in little tiny pieces to it. And yes, we do slightly alter and change our own experiences alter what happens to us but we're not we're not projecting you might say the reality itself reality is doing that on its own so it's something to remind people that um these ideas of it's your fault it's all your fault you should feel guilty or oh it's because of a past life you know we are you were a really bad person so that's why you deserve what happens to you now um again any truly loving god would would say even if 
even if you did do something pretty bad, a real loving God would say, hmm, how can we find a way through kindness to teach this individual a different way of being, a different way of existing so that they will be they will be joyfully want to go out and, you know, if you get a dog that's been abused, if you bring the dog in your house and start beating it with a stick, it's just going to stay an abused dog. You bring the abused dog in and start treating it with kindness and helping it and making it feel safe within a few months, it becomes a wonderful dog again. Yeah. So our reality is built trying to do the opposite, right? It's trying to like continually beat us over the head and tell us it's our fault. And when the shift begins to happen, oh, actually, that's how it's been built here. That's how this place has been constructed. And okay, it can do what it wants, but I don't have to do that, right? Reality can be as insane as it wants, but I'm going to choose sanity. I'm going to find what sanity means for me, and I'm going to walk that path of personal sanity, kindness, empathy, all of those kinds of things, you know, honesty, integrity, and that's how I'm personally going to walk. And reality can do what it wants, and it's not it's not up to me what happens there i can only be responsible then for this thing and i can choose to not be sucked into that thing right. and um that's another kind of how i've started maneuvering through this part of the matrix which is just saying i'm just choosing sanity and that's it figure out sanity and just be that now, say you're in the afterlife realm and they're presenting you with a, a life review and they're they're discussing things with you. Would you say the version of sanity or the version of, you know, knowing yourself? So, so if you you can interact with them skeptically and and argue with them, say, or you could just not even deal with them. I would imagine if if you if you don't because. There's nothing that somebody nothing. in a life review is gonna say to me that's gonna make me go, oh, you're yeah. right. Oh, because of right. my karma, I should, I need to come back here and do this whole thing again. Wipe my memory, please. I know that's not gonna happen. I wouldn't let that happen. I'd argue, you know, to no end. I'd spend my whole afterlife uh, time the arguing. The problem with them. would be, the problem would be is if you had not done a complete life recapitulation, and if you didn't know every moment of your life, and then in this life review. And you're you're interacting with them in the being say, but when you were four years old, this and they're showing it to you on a giant screen, and you're watching it happen, and that's your sister, and, and they're like, you forgot. And if you did not have a complete life review behind you, you would have to say maybe they're right, because I have gaps in my memory. So that's one of the reasons for having a full life recapitulation is there there would be no gaps. Nothing could be presented then that you could possibly fall for. My question, though, would be, are, are, should we be there with them and defending ourselves, or should we, See, you know, the second they try to present us with a whole life review and, and a judgment scene, should we just be like, ah, no, I'm not doing this and try to just get out of it? Right. Or, well, or you know. And this is, yeah, this would be a good question to end with. So we end our conversation here because it's getting... I always find, I don't know about you, but I find that after I hit about an hour and 10 minutes, I just start to get really, yeah, my mind gets sleepy. Absolutely. There's a yeah. time the, the so words don't we'll come as easily. So we'll this one. This is, again, just an opinion because, like all this stuff, I don't know for sure. Like, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm grateful for the people that have shared all their near-death experiences. And, and, and I mean, they're huge now, right? Like, you go to some of these channels that are shipped, they, they get like 800,000 views for a near, near death experience, right? Mm. So, it's, it's, a, that's also really big right now. People want knowledge about the after death experience if they can. So, it's also interesting that that's coming up. But again, and I, I fully, how would I explain this? I fully believe the experience they're sharing. I don't think anybody's making anything up generally. Some do, most aren't. They're being very honest and, and sharing, but no one ever asks, was I tricked? They always take the experience at absolute face value, and it's always positive and wonderful. It's almost nobody has any questions about it when they come back. So we'll leave that out there as an overview. But, yeah, the question would be, if somebody's in that position in the afterlife, 
And if you have found your power, if you have found your true power, the true, you know, the, the true essence of your being, then why would there be any need to interact with anything? Because your power, in a sense, is greater. The power of you is greater than the matrix, if you know that. Um, so as long as you know that, it would just be, yeah. What's the point of this? Right. You know, none. So as soon as, but if someone's not fully in their power and they feel there could be something greater than me out there, there's the instantaneous I better give in a bit to authority and hear what they have to say. Okay. You know, they might know more than me, so to speak. That's the catch. Um, um, it's that, and I'll say more than me because I shouldn't, I shouldn't put it in those words. But, you know, somebody, somebody is, something is more powerful than me. Something is more total than me. Then already that's, there's that belief. And like we talked about earlier, the belief will start manifesting it. But if it comes from not from a necessary, because you can't believe it either. You can't if you just believe I'm more powerful than everything else, and you might generate an experience where you're more powerful than everything, and you're commanding them, and you're telling them what to do, and they're running. You, you just you, know, you create a different scenario. It's more of a sense of I know I have, I know I'm more powerful than the beings in the matrix, and mm. that's it. Right. You know I I know, and that's just there's nothing else I need to do about it. It's just okay. I've I realized that, and then. Um, why yeah, and why would you need to interact with them at all? And that's the same way that, um, like psychologists uh, interact with narcissism and manipulative behaviors. That you know, at first people try to defend themselves and they try to prove why the other person, the manipulator, is wrong and all this. But then eventually, they say that the only way that you can ever have peace from a sociopath or a narcissist is no contact. You don't fight them anymore. You realize what they are, and then you get them out of your life. I would say similar, you know, the love bombing and all, all those things that happen to us in the afterlife state seem to uh, be reminiscent of narcissistic manipulation techniques. So uh, the answer yeah. uh, may be similar. <laughs> you just don't deal with it. Just like a narcissist in this life, why bother defending yourself when they don't care anyway? Right. These people trying to guilt you into certain life review things. If you've right. done the work, as you'd say, you, why would you even talk to them? Right. Exactly. I think that's a really good, not a really good example of, of a, a tool that could be used of like, okay, how would I deal with that in this life? Mm. I'll do it exactly the same way there. They're just, they're just narcissism on a bigger scale. Right. 